So far, we constructed the automaton ought psi associated to a formula of psi. Now we move to discuss the correctness of this construction. Namely, show that it satisfies the desired property mentioned before, that the language accepted by this automaton corresponds to the traces that satisfy the formula. More precisely, for any set of states S, labeling function L, an infinite sequence of states pi, we have that pi satisfies psi if and only if ought psi accepts its corresponding atom set trace. We must prove an equivalence, an if and only if statement. First, um, we prove the left to right part of this equivalence. So let's assume that psi satisfies phi. Let's say the trace pi consists of the states S0, S1, and so on. And let, for each i, ai denote the labeling of state Si. We need to show that ought psi accepts a0, the word a0, a1, and so on. So we must find an accepting run for it. Our run will actually be k0, k1, and so on, where ki consists of all formulas in the closure of psi that are satisfied by the i suffix of pi. So why is this a run? For it to be a run, first we need each ki to be a state in our automaton, that is, be in the set Q, uh, which means be an elementary set of formulas. This can be checked using the properties of formula satisfaction. Remember that the properties that define what elementary means mimic the properties of satisfaction. Then we need k0 to be an initial state, which is immediate applying the definitions and using that pi satisfies psi. Finally, for a run, we need to check uh, uh, that ki transits through ai to ki plus one. And this can be checked from the properties of formula satisfaction, also using the expansion laws for always, eventually, and until. Remember that the transition relation between scenarios was defined keeping in mind the properties of satisfaction when moving from one state to the other. As a general rule, if you follow the previous discussion about why the automaton's components were defined the way they were, this proof will be understandable. The definitions were essentially chosen so that this proof will go through. I mean, the overall proof of the theorem will go through. And for k to be um, an accepting run, we will need that it visits calligraphic f infinitely often. Uh, more precisely, the sets in the accepting sets in calligraphic f infinitely often. This again follows from the properties of satisfaction and the way calligraphic f was defined keeping in mind that the long-term behavior uh, of the temporal connectives was considered in the definition of calligraphic F. For example, let's take eventually. What we need to check is that if eventually phi is in the closure, then for infinitely many i's, eventually phi being in, chi, in ki will imply that phi itself is in ki. And this is true because for any i where eventually phi holds, there will be a j further up in the future where both eventually phi and phi will hold. Please take it as an exercise to prove the last statement. This concludes the proof of the left to right implication.
For the other implication, we assume the automaton has an accepting run, k0, k1, and so on, uh, for the atom set trace of pi through L, which we denote by A0, A1, and so on, by taking AI to be L of SI. What we need to show is that pi satisfies our formula psi. We're actually going to show something more general. Instead of assuming that k0, k1, and so on is an accepting run, we will generalize the statement by not assuming that the run must start in an initial state, which meant that k0 contained our formula psi, but that it starts in some state k0 that contains some formula phi in the closure of psi. So what we do is relativize the statement from our fixed formula psi to any formula phi in its closure. And we also strengthen the implication to an if and only if. In short, we will prove condition um, that conditions 1, 1, 1, 3, and 2 shown on this slide imply the condition marked with an asterisk. Please test your understanding by reflecting on why this last statement is more general than the statement we wanted to prove in the first place. We will now prove this more general statement. So we have a sequence pi with AI denoting its atom set labelings and assume that each KI is elementary and consecutive KIs transit through the AIs in our automaton, or to psi. And also that the KIs visit infinitely often the accepting sets of our automaton. And we must show that um, for all formulas phi in the closure of psi, being in K0 is equivalent to being satisfied by our sequence pi. We prove this by induction on the structure of phi. Here are some representative cases. If phi is an atom p, we have the following chain of equivalences. Belonging to K0 means belonging to A0 by the, for, for P, by the way the transition relation is defined. Remember that some Ki transits somewhere through some Ai, just in case Ai consists of all atoms in Ki. This is by definition of the transition relation. Um, and this gives us what we want by the definition of the satisfaction relation. So we started with P, with membership uh, of P to K0, and show that this is equivalent to satisfaction by Pi. And our proof of this case is done. This was an easy case, but in a way, uh, this case is characteristic to part of what needs to be done in every case. We apply the definition of the automaton's various components. Here we use the definition of the transition relation. Um, and then the definition of satisfaction for that particular type of formula. The other part that will be handled in the other cases will be the application of the induction hypothesis so far, this was a base case, so no induction hypothesis here. Let's now see a properly inductive case. Assume phi uh, has the form phi1 and phi2. We again proceed by a chain of equivalent statements. Phi1 and phi2 belonging to K0 means by the propositional consistency of K0 that both phi1 and phi2 are in K0. <clears throat> Which means, by the induction hypothesis, that phi1 and phi2 hold for pi. By the way, to test your understanding, uh, 
please pause now and ask yourself, why is it okay to apply the induction hypothesis here? Of course, this is the essence of the induction method. We assume what needs to be proved. Um, namely, membership to K0. is equivalent to satisfaction by phi. We assume this for the smaller formulas, phi 1 and phi 2. This assumption is called the induction hypothesis. And now we are in the process of proving our statement for the larger formula phi, which is phi 1 and phi 2. So back to our proof, we just apply the induction hypothesis for phi 1 and for phi 2. Now we apply the definition of satisfaction to obtain that phi 1 and phi 2 holds for pi, and we are done. We started with membership to k0, and again proved by a chain of, of equivalences that this is equivalent to satisfaction by pi. Notice that this case, like the previous one, was entirely routine. We just, <coughs> it's just that we additionally apply the induction hypothesis. So we just apply the definitions and the induction hypothesis. And uh, the same proof will work in the same way for all propositional connectives. But let's actually consider another propositional connective, namely negation, which is also routine, but illustrates an interesting, an interesting point. So phi has the form not phi 1. We start with not phi 1 belonging to k0, which means that phi 1 does not belong to k0. which further means, by the induction hypothesis, that phi 1 does not hold for pi, which further means that not phi 1 holds for pi, and we are done. Now the interesting bit. Notice that we apply the induction hypothesis for the statements in negated form. Okay, so this is the moment when we apply the induction hypothesis, which shows you why we had decided in the first place, to strengthen the statement to be proved from an implication to an if and only if. If we try to prove by induction an implication only, let's say if we try to prove phi belongs to k0 implies pi satisfies phi, which was the original setting, um, this would not have worked. The induction proof would have failed for the case of negation. Now, moving on to the temporal connectives, let's consider that phi has the form, let's assume that phi has the form next phi 1. Let k prime 0, k prime 1, and so on be obtained from, uh, be obtained by shifting by 1 the sequence k 0, k 1, and so on, in that each k prime i is equal to k i plus 1. Now, next phi 1 in k0 means, by the definition of the transition relation in our automaton, that phi 1 is in k1. In other words, in other words, phi 1 is in k prime 0. Furthermore, by the induction hypothesis, mind you, apply to k prime and the, and the one suffix of pi, not to k and pi we obtain that phi 1 holds for the 1 suffix of pi. Which further means, by the definition of satisfaction, that pi satisfies next phi 1, and we are done. So one thing to note uh, in this case is that we apply the induction hypothesis correctly for a smaller formula, uh, phi 1, 
but with different parameters, k and pi, obtained by modifications of the original k and pi. This flexibility was necessary in order for our arguments to work. Let's consider one more case, that of phi being of the form eventually phi 1 for some formula phi 1. Here, we will need a similar flexibility, a similar uh, amount of flexibility um, when applying the induction hypothesis as in the case of next discussed before. But we don't know in advance how much uh, shifting of the sequence of states k will be needed. So we define shifting by j for any choice of j. We add j as a superscript, uh, as a, a superscript to k to indicate that we have shifted k by j positions, that's thus starting at position j. This is really the j suffix of k, just like pi j denotes the j suffix of pi. Where by k, in this context, I, I mean the actual sequence, k0, k1, and so on. So instead of repeating k0, k1, and so on, I just say k. We have the following equivalences. Eventually, phi uh, is in k0. If and only if there exists some j such that phi1 is in kj, which means that phi1 belongs to uh, kj0. which is the item on position zero in the j suffix of k. Applying the induction hypothesis to the j, j suffixes of pi and k, we obtain that the j suffix of pi satisfies phi one. And this is for some j. But this really means that pi satisfies eventually phi one. And we are done. At this point, let us have a check that you are awake. Is there any major gap, gap in this proof? Yes, of course. One of the steps was based on a claimed lemma. So what we further need to justify is the following, uh, which is the lemma that we have used in that proof. For all formulas phi, with eventually phi in the closure of psi, we need that eventually phi is in k0 if and only if phi is in kj for some j. In other words, we need that our sequence of scenarios, k0, k1, and so on, behave in a way that is similar to the semantics of eventually. Indeed, similarity with the semantics was the key to our definitions of concepts related to the scenarios in our automaton. So we are in a good position to prove this. This is an if and only if. So let's prove the two implications one at a time. Um, first, let's assume that eventually phi is in k0. Since consecutive uh, ki's transit through the ai's, using the definition of the transition relation in our automaton, we have two cases, either phi is in k0, or phi is not in k0, and eventually phi is in k1. A note here, in terms of our discussion of unfinished business from before in relation to scenarios, what we have here is that case one fulfills the eventuality, whereas case two postpones it to next time. Now, if case two holds, meaning eventually phi is in k1, then we apply the same reasoning for k1 and obtain two cases. Either phi is in k1 or is not in k1 and eventually phi is in k2. And now the same thing for k2 and so on. So if case two keeps being the case, it means that we keep kicking the can down the road without having phi in the scenarios ki. But 
the sequence k is an accepting run in our automata, which by the definition of the accepting sets contains, among others, the fulfillment of eventually phi. This means that eventually phi in kj implies phi in kj infinitely often, that is, for an infinite number of j's. So k2 cannot go on forever, since this would mean that for all j, eventually phi is in kj, but phi is not, which would contradict the above. In other words, case one has to hold at some point. So we obtain a j such that phi is in kj, which is what we were looking for. So the proof of the implication is done. For the implication in the opposite direction, we assume phi in kj for some j. Since kj is elementary and therefore temporally consistent, we obtain that eventually phi is in kj. Now we distinguish two cases, depending on whether j is zero or not. If j is zero, then there's nothing to prove. If j is greater than zero, let j prime be its predecessor. We apply the definition of the transition relation to obtain that eventually phi must also be in kj prime. Indeed, remember that the transition relation of our automaton incorporates the idea of consistent transitions between the current and the next scenarios. In our case here, say kj prime is the current and kj is the next scenario. Then eventually phi could not appear in kj out of the blue but must have already been in kj prime. This is in the nature of eventually. So what we did is argue that from eventually phi in kj, we obtained that eventually phi is also in kj prime for j prime, the predecessor of, of j. And we can keep repeating this argument. Clearly j cannot decrease forever without becoming zero. So at some point we must have case one. Which gives us the desired fact. Eventually phi is in K zero. Okay, so this concludes the proof of the lemma. As homework, please prove the remaining cases in the, in the main in the proof of the main uh, theorem. I have shown the proof for all connectives except for or implies always and until. The cases of the propositional connectives or and until are completely routine and perfectly similar to that of and. So, but they are good for warm up as warm up exercises. Whereas the cases of uh, temporal connectives always and until are interesting. They will need the conditions defining the fulfillment sets of these connectives, similarly to how we use uh, these conditions in the case of the eventually connective. Okay, to recap what we've done so far. For any formula Psi, we defined ought Psi the GNBA, Generalized Non-Deterministic Buki Automaton, associated to Psi. And about this automaton, we prove that satisfaction of Psi by a sequence is equivalent to the automaton accepting the atom set trace of this sequence. This allows us to say that the automaton ought Psi mimics or simulates or encodes the semantic behavior of a formula Psi. Next, we will bring not only formulas, but also the LTSs into the picture, showing how to include code the satisfaction of a formula by an LTS, also as an automata. And finally, we'll show how this encoding allows deciding the satisfaction relation.